This week was back to school for millions of school children across the country, and New South Wales families were given just hours to apply for a $500 voucher to help with the cost of before and after school care and vacation care. Now, households with primary school children aged between 4 to 13 had until just 11.59 on Tuesday, January the 31st, to apply for the before and after school care vouchers on behalf of each eligible child. Now, this move is obviously an attempt by the state government to secure votes, but it also highlights just how expensive childcare has become and the strain being placed on young families. Well, joining us again at the Informer is our now regular fortnightly contributor, Professor of Economics at ANU, Ben Phillips. Welcome, Professor. Good afternoon. Now, childcare, it's its right in the news. We're seeing big changes coming in in uh, June 31st. Where do we need to go with this, Professor? Yeah, look, childcare is a real challenging um, area of public policy in Australia. So um, one of the problems we've got is that, um, you know, it's, it's very much provided these days by the private sector, some not-for-profit, some for-profit. Um, perhaps ideally, we, if we were starting again, uh, we, we would be more looking at, say, joining up with, say, the, the public school system, so attaching it to, 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 um, to, to primary schools and making it more affordable and cheaper in, in, with that approach. However, the system that we've got, which is probably hard to change at this point, having the more the profits and the, and the, and the not-for-profit sector, has become very expensive, very expensive for governments and very expensive um, for, for parents, of course. Um, and as you say, at the end of June this year, we've got a new scheme where the child the childcare subsidy is going to be expanded quite dramatically, and that will, at least in the short term, make childcare much more affordable for particularly low or, in fact, right across the income spectrum, much more affordable. Um, but it will be interesting, interesting to see what happens in terms of increased demand and where prices go. Um, the government, the Labor government, has talked about um, including the ACCC, the Com- Competition and Consumer Commission, to keep a check on prices, but um, it's unknown how how successful that will be. Mm. Now, the care sector, it's a tricky one because the profit for care seems to always raise that conflict where it shouldn't shouldn't be a uh, profit, but how do we fund it? Yeah, so the drama we've got at the moment, of course, is that we've got this childcare subsidy, which has been increasing very dramatically through time. So it was something like only about say it had, had a childcare subsidy, a childcare benefit back in the in the eighties and nineties. It was very very minimal, and we've recently say or about fifteen or so years ago had a childcare rebate, which is fifty percent of the of the upfront costs, and that's since been increased with the new childcare subsidy, where it starts it was about to start at about ninety percent for low income families, and then tapers away to zero percent for very very high income earning families of say five hundred and thirty thousand dollars per year. So that's how the, the subsidy works, but it's quite it will be quite relatively generous, but unfortunately it also means that it does enable the providers to increase their fees. Um, it also enables them to provide a better service, I would think. Um, but it, the facts remain that childcare is very expensive. So it will be interesting to see where the new scheme takes us with regard to affordability in, in the future. Mm. Are we looking at creating a perfect storm here then to see prices increase even more where we're seeing a large number of centres operating already with staff waivers because of staffing shortages, because of the uh, relatively low pay and um, full work p- workforce participation rates that we're seeing options are up, the increased subsidies, could the increased subsidies be eaten up by increased prices and we end up back where we were as far as outgoings as a family? Look, I think in the short term, no. I think in the short term, you will find that childcare okay, will be much more affordable. Uh, we had a similar sort of percent of increase, I think, under the Rudd government. I think it might have, it was either Rudd or the Gillard government, I forget now, where um, the childcare rebate was was greatly expanded. Um, so certainly in the short term, you'll see affordability improvements. But as you point out, it's over the long term, which is where the concern might be that prices um, will continue to increase at a rate well above the, the consumer price index, keeping in mind at the moment, of course, the CPI is, is a bit crazy but it hopefully won't always be like that but yeah what we have seen is that price rises have been very very sharp and if that continues then yeah you'll be back to where you back to square one mm. could we incentivize workplaces to pay part of this uh look you could do one of the concerns i guess around that though is when you put it onto the employer um they will look at say uh, perhaps a, a young woman or increasingly a young man who might be 
it has small children as being a potential cost. Um, so that's where it's probably best to have the uh, the cost, um, you know, work through the government rather than rather than the than, um, than the providers, the, the the employees, I should say. What about funding as a part of the education system? Look, I think in an ideal world, if we were to unscramble the egg, and it's a very complicated egg to try and unscramble, I think you would try and go through a more of a, a public-based system, and perhaps that's still possible, but um, it seems like a very, very large reform um, that perhaps government might be reluctant to to undertake. But I think, yes, if you're starting again, you would look at you know having childcare as being similar to primary school, but exp- just expanding it so that it applies to you know one, two, three, four-year-olds um, and including preschool in that um, and having a public system, which probably would be cheaper to provide. The, the profit motive doesn't seem to be um, necessarily imp- improving the, the quality of education. It seems to be increasing the cost to government, increasing the cost to parents. Um, it, it's a tricky one, Professor. How do we increase wages in this sector, attract more people into it without increasing prices? Is there a mechanism there that the government could pull? Look, I think probably the way to do that is is the way we look at it, say, with, with award wages. So you increase the, the award wages. Um, of course, businesses may not like that because they'd say that it increases the, the cost. But look, they've been increasing their fees by 6 7 8% per year. And I'm not quite sure where the money's been going because if it hasn't been going to staff, perhaps that's where it should be. So it could be a, a way of forcing them, in a sense, to to, to increase the pay to, to those very low-paid um, staffers who are mostly, mostly females. Mm. And how do we get a, around the gender aspect of it when we see most of the equality initiatives were set in a time where men were either considered um, unsuitable, unable or uninterested in raising children. So it was more about supporting women into the workforce while still maintaining their caring responsibilities. Do you think we would ever be willing to see a um, society where we incentivize men by giving them a little bit extra to actually uh, take up the, the child care mantle? Look, I think it's entirely possible. So certainly in, say, countries like Norway and Sweden and Denmark, uh, things are quite different over there. So childcare is is more is a lot cheaper in those countries, more more publicly based um, than what it is here in Australia. Um, also, they've got much greater uh, leave provisions for both men and women. Um, they're ahead of us by, say, probably 10 or 20 years at least, and they have been for a long time. So I think one way to improve that situation is to um, encourage employers and also obviously through the government, through their parental leave schemes, to open it up more so for men than what we have had in the past. In the past, we've only had two weeks leave for men with the with the current, the, I think it's the, called the, the dad leave. Um, so you've I think previously, I think you've had about 18 weeks, I think, for the, for the mother and only two weeks for the men. It's being expanded. I think it's going to become about... I don't quote me on the exact figures here, but something like five weeks, I think it might be for men. But I think it needs to be to be bigger than that. I think you need to have, you know, perhaps um, you know, at least a full six months, which is split between the, the male and the female, or perhaps even even longer. I think that experience of spending a lot of time with with small children at home, I think that changes your perspective and you'd be more likely to to share the the, the load with with the mother in future years. Um, and obviously, in, in the first six months or so, it's it's a bit different um, with with breastfeeding requirements. But beyond that, I think there's no reason why men can't be looking after small children as much as as much as women. It's a um, it need to shift the dial in terms of societal expectations um, and and what what men what men's expectations are around their their care requirements. Yeah, it's it's my wheelhouse here, Professor. And, and until we tie boys as tightly to fatherhood as what we do girls. To motherhood, we've got a long way to go with men entering professions such as construction, trades, manufacturing, transport. The the male dominated ones are also the least family friendly ones. Yeah, but that's absolutely right. I think it's. I mean, look, there are changes happening, and uh, I mean, myself as a young father, I see quite a lot of young men, say down at the, the cafe in the morning with small children. But it's still, you know, for every man you see, there is a small child. You've probably got you know six or seven or even more women who are doing it. Uh, perhaps 30 years ago, you would have seen no men. So it is changing, but it's still got a long way to go. Mm. And if you look at the cultural representations of fathers, when you look at the fetishized Disney depictions of motherhood with only a mother's love, mother knows best, maternal instinct, and then you look at men apart from Bluey, I can't think of a, a respectful 
um, contemporary representation of fatherhood when you consider Homer Simpson, Al Bundy, Daddy Daycare, they're all bumbling uh, man-childs. And when, you know, when there's something to be done, kids call for mum because, gee, you know, mum mum knows everything and it's not so much that mum knows stuff, it's just that's the expectation and mums are awfully, often struggling and, you know, they wear the weight of expectations for as long as we dads don't drop them on the head too often. Oh, we're amazing. You do a plat and it's like you killed cancer. Yeah, I, I think it's that's absolutely right. The culture in Australia is still very much based around mother has a child, the mother looks after the baby and the father is, you know, as you say, if the father does anything, it's it's quite remarkable. Um, I think men need to be encouraged to do to do a lot more with with children, and I think if they do that, you'll see that there will be considerable change in Australia, and that they'll be much more involved with their children. I think that's only a only a, only a good outcome. Yeah, that that lazy dad trope does so much harm because workplaces feel that they don't need to enable or have that expectation that gee, you know, they ask dad if he's going to take time off, not how much time he's going to take off. So. That expectation uh, is really important because I don't care what policies you have in place as an organisation, your culture eats strategy for for breakfast. Yeah, look, certainly I'm very, I've been very lucky being here at um, ANU myself, where there's there's leave for both mothers and fathers. Um, so I took six months off um, to be the principal carer, and that was an amazing experience. And look, I'd certainly encourage other males who are lucky enough to be in that sort of situation I'd encourage employers that there are real benefits from that um certainly it makes me feel a little bit more loyal towards my employer um so I think there can be benefits as well yeah I think that'll be where we'll make make the next big gains professor is when we actually focus on empowering and enabling men because the Workplace Gender Equality Agency in Australia reports that currently 70% of Australian workplaces have a flag formal flexible work policy, but less than 2% have set targets for men's engagement in it. And, you know, you can have the most egalitarian uh, relationship at home, but when school calls and says, bub's sick, going to be a couple of days off school, mum's workplace is in the 70% that does have flexible, dad's is in the 98% yep. that doesn't, it's not a gender decision it's not a, a family decision it's the environment that we, we've set up because that expectation that dads don't want to do it and the look, dads i know have done it have loved it and would never go backwards look as i said there's there's um you know various scandinavian countries where that's really not the case so it could certainly be done but we've just got to change the dial on, on the culture and there's obviously there's also economic incentives around 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 paid leave and around say child care and things like that that can make a big difference Yep. All right, Professor, we've got to leave it there and we'll look forward to seeing you in a fortnight as another regular on the Informer. My pleasure. Thank you very much.